So what I want to talk about today is, from our vantage point, what we're seeing in terms of the future of healthcare. So as Sam mentioned, uh, I work at Andreessen Horowitz. We're a Silicon Valley-based uh, uh, venture capital firm. And when we launched the firm about 10 years ago, one of the founders, Mark Andreessen, famously wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal where he described um, how and why software was eating the world. And what he meant by that was that software, or technology broadly, uh, transforms virtually every industry that it touches. And if there's one industry that has given software indigestion, <laughs> has been the healthcare industry. Um, and probably in turn, software has given the healthcare industry some indigestion as well. And so what I want to talk about today is a bit about the future and why we see that in many ways this time really is different um, in terms of how we're thinking about um, where technology will shape the future of healthcare, how it'll change how we get um, access to healthcare, how we think about treating diseases, and ultimately how technology can help keep us healthier in our lives. So let's start at the beginning. We all get sick. And while the details differ um, and the circumstances differ, the patient journey is all somewhat similar. You start to feel crummy. Your body tells you something's wrong. You hop in your car, you go to the doctor. Or if it's more serious, you go to the hospital. You get diagnosed. You hopefully get treated. And when you get released, if you need any uh, additional therapy or medicine, you get back in your car and you drive to a pharmacy. Now, that's basically the way we think about accessing the healthcare system today. But what if there were a world without hospitals or pharmacies? That might be a, a, a you know, tantalizing uh, proposition for some of the folks in this room. Um, but it's actually not that far-fetched. If we go back in the not-too-distant past, we once lived in that world. When you got sick, your doctor came to your home to take, take a look at you and to take care of you. Everything that doctor needed was sitting in his medicine bag, in his Gladstone bag. And if there was anything you needed for your care that wasn't in that bag, he could walk down the street and go to an apothecary or a compounding pharmacy and get something made for you. But as medicine advanced, we had to build grand institutions to house the new practice of medicine. So a great case in point is Johns Hopkins hospitals. So Johns Hopkins opens its doors in about 1889, and really, in many ways, was one of the first models of a teaching hospital here in the United States. And really what drove the creation of, of Johns Hopkins was a recognition that the care of medicine was becoming increasingly specialized. And so we started to see specialties emerge and be developed, and alongside that, uh, physicians that were specializing in spe uh, specific disease areas or parts of the body. So with that specialization, it now becomes, as you can imagine, more impractical to have the doctor come see you at home if you have a whole bevy of specialists that um, are now centralized in one place. It makes more, more sense for you to go to them. And along with the specialization of medicine comes the specialization of technology and equipment used to uh, drive care. And if we look through sort of midway through the last century, of course, a lot of that equipment is big and it's expensive and it's bulky. So then, of course, it doesn't make sense to put any of that stuff in a Gladstone bag, so it makes sense for you to go to it as opposed to have it come to you. And if you're going to have a grand institution centralized, you need the ability to, of course, scale that. So if we look at Johns, the Johns Hopkins medical system today, it's about an $8 billion system, 1,000 beds, uh, thousands of physicians caring for patients that come from all over the world. But with scale comes a challenges in terms of costs, both from a dollar standpoint. So we know that we spend about a trillion dollars every year paying for hospitalizations in the US, some of which may be unnecessary and some of which may be inefficient. We also know that beyond the dollar cost, there's a great human cost to, uh, to treating uh, patients through the, health, through the hospital systems. Because of the complexity of care, um, there's a lot of uh, the human toll associated with medical errors. And that's to say nothing for the amount of money and, and human toll that comes from bringing the sick together and having the risk of, of them uh, cap, catching hospital-acquired infections. But as I started at the beginning, we also see that there is a shift in technology today that hopefully is going to meet with other key tectonic shifts that we're seeing in the healthcare system, both in terms of stakeholders that are in the space, both existing and new entrants, 
in terms of expectation and demands from the people that are on the receiving end of care, and in the emergence of new technologies, which I'll, which I'll go through. So let's talk about the, the first one, the industry structure. The silos that have traditionally uh, defined the healthcare system in the US have started to dissolve. We have insurers and payers and technology companies and insurers coming together um, to uh, become more monolithic companies across the continuum of care. We also have th the payers, whether they're traditional insurers, governments, employers, becoming increasingly frustrated with the state of affairs today. And if you're going to talk about payers, you have to recognize that more and more is being expected and demanded of consumers in terms of the money that comes out of their own pocket for their own care. So it's not surprising that consumers in turn are demanding more of the healthcare system or will continue to demand more of the healthcare system, especially as technology has transformed virtually every other part of their lives. And then when you think of industry structure, you think of incumbents. And one of the fascinating things about healthcare, again, something I'm sure folks here are very familiar with, is you have new entrants come into the space, many of which are dominant incumbents in other adjacent industries, whether it's retail or technology, that have now focused on healthcare, given all of the, the challenges and per, you know, perceived opportunities that exist in our healthcare system. And not only do you have incumbents moving into the space, you actually have new companies being built from scratch, many of which are using technology at their very core um, to think about new ways to deliver care. And finally, none of this um, the talk about technology um, makes a lot of sense unless you talk a little bit about um, some of the key technologies that we're seeing start to move into the healthcare system. And I'll go through this a bit more in a few minutes, but we're seeing the rise of artificial intelligence being used across the healthcare system. We, we're seeing the use of big data. Certainly the, the, the availability of it is there, and now the question is how we can use this in an effective way. And we're seeing the rise of new modalities of medicines that have incredible promise to tackle and even cure some of our most intractable diseases, but will also come at an incredible cost and challenges for access broadly. So now we're at this really interesting inflection point. Healthcare has left the building. The delivery of care has broken out of the traditional walls of the hospital and moving towards where we work and live. So in the future of healthcare, how will we get access to the system? Well, we're already seeing a lot of this happening today. Folks that have children, I'm sure seen plenty of these, um, the minute clinics or the urgent care clinics where you can walk into a more of a retail setting and get access to a broader and broader range of treatments for a broader and broader range of conditions. And then of course, as demographic shift in this country, we're seeing more and more of, of health happening at home. And that's not to say that hospitals will disappear altogether, but I think what's very surprising is the kinds of procedures and activities that we'll see in hospitals will be specialized to the things that are so incredibly complex, like surgeries that require incredibly specialized equipment, like we saw in the, in the early days of the rise of the centralized hospital. But I think what's also surprising is that we'll see more and more of technology moving into the home to enable us to, to do a broader range of care services in the home. Here you see pictured um, an ICU at home that uses a broad range of equipment that would, wouldn't be too uh, out of place in a hospital setting. And if how we get access to our care changes, who will deliver our care is also changing. One of the most surprising things that we've seen as we've talked to academic institutions is how focused medical schools are today in ensuring that their physicians are technology native in terms of being able to train and use new technologies. And I think one of the most surprising things we'll see is the emergence of new specialties that come from the use of technology in healthcare, much like radiologists, of course, came on the backs of the, ability, the availability of X-ray technologies. And one of the interesting Back to the Future moments that we see is that um, telemedicine has given us the ability to go back to the time where the doctors can come to you. So now you can get access to a broad range of specialists uh, through your computer screen or through your tablet. And I think we'll continue to see use cases where this becomes a very uh, active front door for care. And speaking of technology, companies like Omada or Lavongo are using technology to help assist specializations and act as digital coaches for some of the most complex and chronic conditions that need persistent management. So who delivers our care is changing, how we get access to care is changing, and we know that if part of the reason of going to the hospital is because the, special, the equipment was specialized in one place and centralized in one place, the new Gladstone bag, the medicine bag, is the telephone. So 
It sounds trivial to, of course, call it a telephone. We know it's a supercomputer that sits in our pockets. And it's, and of course, early days, this is not a, a, a central part of care today, but it's been fascinating to see the broad range of, of applications that you can do on, on an iPhone today, whether it's an EKG or, or um, uh, to manage uh, blood pressure, or you can do uh, DNA sequencing even today. And so this change is happening in real time. And you know, once it becomes software, it will move at an increasingly um, accelerated pace. And so the neat thing about hospitals is they may not disappear altogether, but what we are seeing is that once your care used to come to you, centralized hospitals made you go to your care, but we've already seen various waves of how your care is coming back to you in a very personalized way. So what about pharmacies? I said pharmacies would disappear. Well, one, one of the things that's really interesting if you look at the history of pharmacy in the United States is the father of pharmacy had this very prophetic vision where he said, if the pharmacist becomes a mere dispenser of medicines, he'll relapse into a, a simple shopkeeper. And it's pretty prophetic if you walk into a retail pharmacy today in terms of what it looks like. So what gave rise to this? Well, what gave rise to this was the ability to improve manufacturing technologies to give us pills and capsules so that we could um, make the you know, medications widely available at a reasonable uh, cost to manufacture. And then that gave, of course, rise to the retail pharmacies where you could walk to your corner store and pick up whatever medicines you needed um, that were prescribed to you. But this is an area where we're seeing dramatic change as well. So first of all, the idea of going to pick up your medicines is going to disappear. We've seen Amazon acquire PillPack, so your medicine is more likely to get drop shipped to you in the near future than you get in your car and going to pick it up. We also have um, companies like Zipline that are using drone technology to deliver medicines to some of the most um, difficult to access places in the world, and it's not hard to imagine that that will be coming uh, to a, a, you know, a front yard near you at some point soon. And so medicine is really in many ways leaving the pill bottle. So for the mass-produced ones, we will find ways to hand deliver them, whether it's truck or drone. Uh, but importantly, as digital therapies emerge, it may be that your next prescription isn't a pickup, it's a download. And finally, as we see living medicines emerge, like engineered cells or gene therapies, obviously you're not going to get those picked up at a pharmacy. Um, those will, get, uh, will be you know, delivered to you in a very, very different setting. And so what's fascinating about pharmacy today is going back to William Proctor's original vision, the medicines were once made for you, then they were manufactured for the masses, and now they're being programmed for you again, whether it's the logistics of it coming to your door or the literal biology of it being programmed specifically for a patient. And what's fascinating about this is just like the physician's practice is going to change with the use of technology, I think in many ways we're going to see the emergence of a next generation of pharmacists that goes back to the original vision that William Proctor had where it's not just a shopkeeper, it's someone who's actually helping manage what is a very complex range of medications. Okay, so all of this is predicated on the fact that we people get sick. But what if we don't get sick anymore? What if symptoms disappear altogether? Now, this sounds, of course, pretty far-fetched, but if you look at the history of healthcare over the last uh, decades, we've made incredible strides in addressing some of the most um, vaccine conditions we've had as a society. Of course, there have, been, there have been the emergence of others, but what's fascinating is we're getting much better at early detection to help catch disease earlier in its progression. Companies like Freenome are using artificial intelligence uh, to make the next generation of diagnostics. Companies like QBio are working at the intersection of um, advanced computation and medical physics to build the physical of the future. But getting a screen is a uh, reactive process that happens at a scheduled pace. What we're seeing increasingly is that technology will become woven into our everyday social fabric. Health will become a part of everyday, a, a, an everyday part of our lives, whether it's the access to um, you know, wearables that monitor our health on a regular basis, like cardiogram that can follow your, your heart rate and actually pick up some very incredible things like AFib or high blood pressure or potentially other ailments before they actually become uh, conditions themselves. And so this idea that we may not get sick anymore is incredibly um, uh, intriguing in the sense that it's, it's probably hard to imagine that it's happening today, but we're starting to see that the earlier and earlier intervention of care is, can have incredible impacts, not only on costs, but on outcomes for patients in terms of their wellness. So the question is, are we ready? So we're talking about the future, and all of this probably sounds incredibly Pollyannish and perhaps even a bit naive. But what we know 
is that the healthcare system has, over decades, adapted to novel technologies. Imperfectly, perhaps, um, with challenges, of course, but the delivery of care has continued to improve with ev every subsequent generation, and that will undoubtedly be the case as we move towards the future that um, we've just described here. Now, to, I'm gonna misquote my good friend um, and, and Gotham City Police Commissioner Jim Gordon when I say, like, what do we need to do to get the healthcare system we need, to get the healthcare system that we deserve? Well, I'll tell you a couple of things. Number one is this grand future is gonna require us to modernize the back office to make sure that all of the incredible and com like complex logistics that go behind the scenes for the delivery of care can keep up with the use of new technologies. So companies like, like Alpha Health are using artificial intelligence to address things like revenue cycle management to make sure that hospitals are able to bill and, and, and basically manage their back office much more effectively and efficiently. But if we're gonna modernize the back office, the, the main reason for doing that is precisely because we're going to see new models as we shift from activity-based care to value-based care. Fee-for-service versus outcomes. And what we've seen is that there are many models that have emerged to think about new ways to both pay for and deliver care. Um, Devoted Health is a company that's uh, reimagining um, what a Medicare Advantage plan would look like from scratch by building technology into its very core. And if healthcare is moving outside of the four walls of the hospital, we know that we will need technology to create frictionless coordination of care. So even within the hospital, we have tools like artificial intelligence that can help physicians deliver better care to their patients, like the work that Suchi Saria uh, uh, is doing with Bayesian Health. Or what about coordinating across an entire healthcare system, uh, the work that uh, Patient Ping is doing to make sure that you have a seamless web of, continuity, of, of communication to manage continuity of care across the healthcare system, across caregivers, across the country. Or the work that Tomorrow Health is doing to manage the very, very tricky transition between getting care in a hospital-based setting and moving into the home, and ensuring that you have the, tech, the right technology so you have the access to the right equipment to manage that transition at a most delicate moment. And then, of course, as we think about miracles of medicine, we will need the ecosystem and the infrastructure to ensure that the next generation of therapies and cures, like engineered cells and gene therapies, can actually be delivered to patients and can be actually accessible to the patients that need them. And this is going to require a pretty broad range of ecosystem development. Number one, uh, hospitals are going to need the logistical ability to um, deliver this care. This is a very complex vein-to-vein -vein, uh, treatments. It looks very different than most other modalities of medicine. But number two, and arguably most importantly, if we're going to make this widely accessible to patients that need them, it's going to have to be affordable. So we'll need new models for how pharmaceutical companies charge for this, and we're seeing early days of this. We're gonna need new models for how payers are able to pay for this and take on the, uh, the associated costs with providing this therapy. And then to connect those two things, we're of course gonna need the models and the technology to monitor for efficacy, to make sure that the therapies are doing what they need to be doing to justify the costs. And so this is work that it's in progress. It's very early days, but this will need to be built if we expect to have these therapies um, uh, to have the effect and the, uh, widely, the wide availability that they will need. And so to just close, look, we all get sick, and that's probably not gonna change anytime soon. But thankfully, because of the people in this room and the people that work broadly across the healthcare system, whether they're incumbents, whether they're upstarts, folks that are looking to deliver real innovations to improve patient care, it's gonna give us the opportunity to make sure that we collectively all get better. Thank you very much.